Hi, my name's Phil, I like to talk about politics. In this video, I'd like to discuss the notion put forward by an Oxford academic and expert in evidence-based public interest projects that the current UK lockdown may do more harm than good. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, then please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So this exercise isn't as such about whether or not the lockdown being put in place is a good thing, because that could go in all sorts of directions. You will find few experts that say that the lockdown should be removed. But this is more about how we process expert opinion and feed it into the public debate, because this is absolutely crucial. The lockdown's effectiveness is directly proportional to the support it has amongst the general public. The government can decree that it be so, and the police can try and enforce it. But if you don't have the public on board, then you are fighting a losing battle. We can see signs of this in the United States and Brazil, where you have some form of regional authorities enforcing lockdowns, but that the presidents of both countries are speaking out against it. You end up with scenes, as we've seen in America and Brazil, where you've got large groups of people all gathering in mass protests against the lockdown, no thought for containing the virus whatsoever, effectively egged on by their head of government. In the UK, we haven't made the situation that bad. Although the government's behaviour could certainly leave a lot to be desired when it comes to open, honest and clear messages, they are at least emphasising the importance of the lockdown measures, not undermining them. Except perhaps when ministers have broken the rules themselves. But part of getting the public on side is assuring them that it's the right decision. Nobody in the UK, or at least not a significant chunk of the population, is going to do something because the government tells them or the police tell them. We do not have a deferential society in this country in the same way that you do in some Asian democracies, for example. So what would happen, for example, if it were reported that a public health expert had said that the lockdown was doing more harm than good. Would you be on board with the measures then? Let me explain what I would do. Five step process. One, check the credentials of the so-called expert to pronounce on such a thing. Two, check to see if they've carried out any research to back up their claims. Three, check the research itself to see exactly what their message was. Is it being misreported, for example? Four, check to see the peer review of the report. And five, consider if there are any conflicts of interest at play. Now, be honest, how many of those five points do you think the average citizen in this country is going to pursue in critically considering such a report? I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest approximately none of them. And such a report was written in the Times, as well as a couple of other right-wing newspapers as well. I single out the Times because the Times is generally one of those newspapers that does not tell lies, but it is biased like all of the newspapers. It reported on a Radio 4 interview where a Professor Carl Hennigan said that the lockdown was the right decision, but it was causing more harm than good. At least that seemed to be the gist from what I could gather. Now, on the Radio 4 interview, some more details were explained about exactly what the professor meant by that. But in the news report, not a thing. They left all that out. They simply reported that he had said the lockdown is doing more harm than good. As a result, the message was deliberately misleading because there was no understanding being projected there. And this is what I mean about the ways that newspapers report. The Times does not make facts up. It does do its due diligence, but they do still report things in a way that they know the reader will draw the wrong conclusion when they want them to. So let's go through my five steps when it came to this report. So I saw this report in the Times, first of all. One, what are the credentials of Professor Hennigan? He is a professor of evidence-based medicine at Oxford. That's good. It means he isn't talking out of his ass. Tick box there. Or is it? So is he an expert in infectious diseases? No, quite the opposite. His expertise is in non-transmissible diseases such as heart disease. So although he is a public health expert, public health is a broad field. Is he a public health expert particularly concerned with the public health problem we have right now? No, he is not. 
He is a researcher and a good one, but he's not an expert in virology, for example. So there's, although there's no doubt that if he carried out research and gathered his evidence, he would be well qualified to draw a valid conclusion. It's not immediately obvious that he can say anything of use about the lockdown measures for this pandemic. But remember his role in cardiovascular disease because that is important in a bit. So two, then we don't dismiss what he's saying at all because he is an expert, he is a scientific expert. Has he carried out any research into the claims made in his newspaper, step two? In other words, has this evidence-based professor based his conclusions on any evidence? No, not at all. He's based it on his observations of the situation and drawing a few empirical conclusions. And for those not into scientific research, empirical means based on experience, not on data or a logical sequence. And this is where his actual area of expertise is important. In his interview, he was describing the difficulty in people getting treatment for other conditions during the lockdown. He's, he's not saying that the lockdown itself is, is directly killing people. What he's saying is there are people not getting surgeries and other treatments needed to deal with life threatening conditions such as heart disease, cancer and so on. And what he's saying is that the lives lost from that could be greater than the lives lost from the coronavirus as a result of the lockdown measures. Note that as far as I can tell, that is not in itself a suggestion that we should remove the lockdown, although that is seemingly what he was suggesting. It seemed that what he was saying is that the lockdown needs to be done differently if it's going to be done at all, and that the lockdown as it exists now is more harmful. But it still doesn't prove that it is, because what he's talking about is trying to save the lives of people with treatable diseases who are being failed at the moment. But of course, there's none of that nuance in the newspaper reports. But anyway, step three, can I check their research to see what they actually mean? No, because there isn't any. <laughs> it's empirical thinking, as I say, but there is a little bit more information in the actual Radio 4 interview. Four, what does peer review suggest? Well, two sides to this. Obviously, if there's no actual research being carried out, there can't have been a peer review of that research because, well, scientists don't peer review nothing. However, public health experts in both the UK as well as internationally who do deal with viral pandemics all suggest that the lockdown is needed in a country where other measures, sorry, such as used in South Korea, where they avoided a complete lockdown, are not being used. Because the scientific consensus is that the lockdown has to remain until you are ready to manage outside of it safely. And that means PPE, not just for members of the NHS, which are still not getting them, but for members of the public as well, mass testing and tracing for those who've been in contact with the infected. We are not equipped to do any of those things and it doesn't look like we're going to be anytime soon. That's what the government needs to focus on. Then five, are there any conflicts of interest at play? Well, it's odd that the reporting of a single line in a more nuanced interview was made only in right-wing newspapers. The Times, for example, is a newspaper aimed at the wealthy. And of course, they would want to see an end to the lockdown, just as they've been calling for an extension to the transition period for Brexit, because they only care about the economy that fuels the wallets of their wealthy readers. Now, one final point I will make, however, and in making this point, it is important to understand the scientific process. So Professor Hennigan is clearly an expert in the general sense. You can't just dismiss what he says just because you don't necessarily, it doesn't agree with what some other people are saying. But consider this, Albert Einstein was also an expert, undoubted expert, but it didn't stop him making the most embarrassing scientific howlers whenever he strayed slightly away from his small area of expertise. For example, he proudly proclaimed that the universe was not expanding, even when he was shown mathematical proof that it was, and he couldn't fault it. He checked it, couldn't find any mistakes, but he said, nope, 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 it's not happening. Did, did that sway lesser scientists? The fact that the great Albert Einstein said, no, 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 the universe isn't expanding. No, because that's not how the scientific world works. Even the greatest still have to back up their claims because the analytically minded do not take your word for it when what you say is at odds with the evidence. In an interview with the Mail, Professor Hennigan said, that he believed the peak of infections occurred just before the lockdown was enforced. 
based on the peak of deaths being on April the 8th, taking the three weeks into account that it would take for peak infections to translate into peak deaths. Now you could read that and look at that and go, well, the natural conclusion to draw there is that the lockdown has done no good at all, that we'd have still ended up with the same number of deaths if there were no lockdown measures at all, which we know not to be true. But the thing is that that data being referred to is only the peak of officially recorded deaths. We don't actually know the real number of deaths on a day by day basis because the government refused to test people with symptoms unless they're in hospital. We have a rough idea of how many people have died from the coronavirus in hospital, but thousands more have died at home or in residential care homes. We don't know how many because we haven't been testing them. It's actually possible that we still haven't reached the peak of deaths two weeks after the peak of officially recorded deaths. We may be, we may be about there now. The Office for National Statistics in the UK has indicated that the official UK figures for deaths caused by the pandemic is an underestimate by more than 40%. So there's more than 40% real deaths on top of the ones being recorded. Even government ministers admit that the real death toll is much higher than they are reporting. They're not trying to deny that. They don't put a number on it, of course, because they can't because they don't know, because they're not allowing any tests. And that's not a concept that needs a PhD or a lifetime working in medical research to understand. If he's basing his empirical thinking on data which is inaccurate, he has done what Einstein did, proclaimed on a subject because of a gut feeling and not based on a logical scientific approach. So that's my take on this. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, then please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.